Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, let me give you a quick overview of what you want to do today. First, giving you a small introduction, what's Everest and what's new, what are we doing next? And then let's go in the community discussion afterwards. Quick recap for those who are new. Um, we are one project within the Linux Foundation Energy, which is a big collaboration of a lot of open source projects regarding uh, the green electric grid and managing the electricity. And we are within this, the edge interface to smart charging devices. Um, right, I forgot to show this slide. Uh, antitrust notice, I have to show that for some seconds because there might be competitors here within the one call. So that's the antitrust policy. Okay, um, what's Everest? Um, so the idea is that there are a lot of different players in the EV market uh, trying to get charging going and everyone has struggled with a complex infrastructure. Everyone has to do the same coding themselves. And in the end, you have wasted a lot of money because everyone coded the same stuff unnecessarily and you're ending up with pure customer experience and with a lot of incompatibility between different software modules, which should not be the case. Everest um, is now here to be the full software stack you need within the charge point. So it's not intended for the cloud. And it has interfaces for speaking to cars, to a local solar, to electric grid, to humans, and to different kind of cloud interfaces. Um, so here, a full picture of different protocols and different devices we are targeting or we're aiming for. Not everything is yet implemented, but this is the picture we're going for. And so why are we doing that? So why not just having a better standard instead of this 20 standards before? Because we don't think just another standard will solve the situation. Standards are good, but uh, often the solution is not to get more standards to get things better working out. It's like getting the standards implemented better in a more compliant way. And that's what we do here with open source. Um, last slide for the introduction. We also a company supporting this project. And one thing we're offering, especially for the community, is a, a development kit charger. So you can already ask us for engineering samples. The real thing will come in summer. And it's basically a Raspberry Pi with benefits. You can make uh, AC charging with this. It um, comes with a lot of other sending devices uh, with GPS and RFID and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and whatnot. And so you can play, try out a lot of things on this charger for your actual application afterwards, which is probably on a different hardware. Um, so what's new? Let me hand over to Cornelius for this. Yeah, so let's have a quick look into what's new since the last TSC meeting four weeks ago. So we had 24 pull requests being merged um, in the last four weeks. It was mostly bug fixes this time. Um, but there's two bigger ones that I'd like to mention. Um, one is the um, Slack implementation. We had it last time that um, the Slack implementation was already available as a library. Um, and now it's fully integrated into Everest as an Everest module and um, basically fully connected to the um rest of the charging stack uh, with all the um stuff between control pilot signal and slack and, and things working um the other big pull request um which i think is the biggest thing in the last four weeks is that uh, we finally merged the new energy manager architecture into main um and i think there we could have a look a bit more into details um so just a quick recap yeah, this one. Uh, just a quick recap on how modular modularity in Everest works. So um, <laughs> modules are basically separate Linux processes um, that communicate via MQTT with each other. And there's um, the Everest framework around it that holds everything together and manages the communication between the modules. And for the framework to know what uh, modules it needs to load and how they are connected, um, you're basically supplying a JSON configuration file that specifies, uh, like, load this module and connect the interface from this module to the interface of the other module and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's meant to represent basically the hardware you're building within the box. Um, so, for example, if your box does not have an RFID relay, you simply do not load the RFID module. Or if you have a box that has um, two charging connectors, uh, you can just basically load the 
um, all the modules that represent the charging core, you can just load them twice and um, everything in Everest will support the two charging connectors. And um, yeah, and this same idea basically of representing the internal hardware of the um, charging station was now taken uh, for the energy management. So if you go to the next slide, Marco, um, <clears throat> the idea here is that um, within Everest, you can basically assemble the whole um, in-house grid basically uh, with Everest modules. So um, if you look at the left, the, um, the grid connection, there's usually when the grid connection is getting into the house, there's usually a fuse first. Um, in this example, it's 40 amps. So typically in your house, it's hopefully higher. Um, and at that point, there's usually also a power meter. And in this example, for example, we have a um, contract that has a price, uh, different prices every hour. And you can load Everest modules for that. So you can load a price driver that basically pulls pricing from your um, electricity provider. Um, you can load a driver for the power meter here um, and connect them to this fuse. And from there, you connect, for example, another fuse module. This is a typical configuration of um, like a small house where you, for example, have two charging stations in front of the house and three in the parking garage. And uh, the two in front of the house are connected uh, to one 16 amps fuse and the three in the charging garage are connected to one 32 amp fuse. Um, and you can already see that you cannot operate all of them at the same time at full power. Um, and at the same time, you probably have a solar panels on your roof. So there's some energy being injected here as well. And the solar um, for the solar panels, you also get a forecast of the, what it will produce in the next couple of hours, for example. Um, so this can all be represented with average modules that you just connect. Um, and then you can specify for each of the EFSA modules, so for each of the charging uh, connectors, basically, you can specify different charging goals. So a typical situation would be that one of the cars in front of the house, it needs to leave as soon as possible. So it needs to charge as fast as it can. And maybe the other one needs to leave 7 a.m. next morning because then somebody needs to go to work. Um, so there's some time left. And um, with the ISO stack, we can, of course, get um, how much energy the car still requires to fulfill its charging goal. Um, so we can plan ahead um, and calculate an optimized schedule, for example, for this car that ensures that it's fully charged at 7 a.m. in the next morning. But in the meantime, it tries to charge as cheap as possible um, using solar power first. And with, given the forecast for the next couple of hours, it can schedule, say, OK, in the afternoon, maybe there's two hours um, where the sun will be shining. So I'm using those. And I get an estimate um, what I learned for how much the house actually is typically using during that time. So I can estimate how much energy probably will be available from solar. Um, and I have price forecasts from my price provider. So I can see, say that um, if the sun wasn't enough in the afternoon, I can charge the rest um, in the night when the energy is cheap. Um, so that's the typical optimization scenario. And there are other goals. For example, there's a long time parking car um, in the garage that doesn't need to drive away soon when it just wants to charge the solar excess energy that you would otherwise um as put back into the net um and maybe another car is already fully charged or one charger is even unused so that one should not um uh, consume any of the limits basically and what everest is doing now if you configure all these modules um representing your in-house grid um it will run a global optimizer over this whole tree um ensuring that each of the cars fulfill its individual charging goal. And at the same time, it will make sure that the fuses never blow and all of the limitations here um, are correctly limited, basically. And um, this even works if you have other um, things, like, for example, electric heating as well, which sometimes switches on randomly and Everest doesn't know about it. So if you have other uh, consumers attached to a fuse, as long as there is an energy meter attached at the same um, point here in the tree, um, 
it will read out that energy meter and make sure that the fuse never blows. And it will be fast enough, basically, that the fuse actually doesn't blow uh, anywhere in the house. And um, this, of course, is getting a lot more interesting uh, with bidirectional charging. This is not really implemented yet, but it's all prepared for that. Um, and then, of course, you will be able to, for example, discharge one car to charge another one without drawing any en energy from the grid, if that's what you want. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of development going on right now, especially about all the optimization, but the basic architecture of how things plug together is now in main, um, which is, I think, the biggest change in the last four weeks. Um, yeah, and yeah, maybe a quick outlook of what's coming, if you go to the next slide, Marco. Um, especially now that we're using this modular architecture a lot more for a lot of different things, um, it's typically very hard to configure things because there's this one big JSON file where you load all the modules and make all the connections between the modules. Um, so we are currently working on a graphical editor for that. So it's a web interface where on the left you basically have all the modules that are available in Everest and you can just add them to the configuration, move them around um, and draw all the connections graphically. Um, and also for each of the modules you can change the configuration options on the right um on the screen uh, you can see this here editing one of the strings um, and then you can store this configuration and run everest with the updated configuration and this will also come in different user levels so um there will basically the lowest level will be for the box manufacturer where you can configure really the whole box and everything but there will also be a simplified version basically for the electrician installing the things where you don't see all the internals of Everest, but you can just um, arrange the energy tree, for example. So everything that the electrician needs to configure. Um, yeah, so this will improve the user friendliness quite a bit. Yeah, so Marco, next slide. Um, so what's in work in progress right now? Um, most of the work is going on still on the ISO implementation. Um, I will get into that on the next slide. Um, for OCPP, there's still work going on for adding additional profiles. So the, on the core is pretty stable, but we need uh, more work on some of the additional profiles. Um, yeah, the energy management architecture, we just looked at this. Most of the work is going on to, to optimizing things. Um, and what we also just saw is the configuration UI. So these are the topics we're currently working on most. Um, and next slide, Marco. The general roadmap of what we're trying to do over the next couple of months. Um, yeah, web interface, we just looked at uh, for the backend integration. Um, of course, we also want to implement OCPP 2.01. Um, but we decided that we want to finish the optional profiles for 1.6 first before we go into that. Um, as of course, an always ongoing topic is testing with various cars. They all behave a little bit different in some cases. We all know that. Um, and on the ISO stack, there is basically the uh, plug and charge still missing. And we're planning to rewrite everything in C++. Um, we're currently using the RISE V2G. Um, but we don't want to have the Java dependency. And also, it doesn't support the Dash 20. Um, so the plan is to rewrite that completely in C++ and implement the Dash 20 as well as the Dean spec um, for all the DC charging um, there. And this will be quite important to reduce our computer memory footprint because the Java is just blowing it completely at the moment. Um, yeah, there's work planned for grid integration, for example, ADR and USEF. Um, a little bit more about the smart home integration. Um, we're always adding like new hardware drivers for different power meters and different charge controller hardware. So um, for those who are new, Everest is really an open project that tries to support as many hardware controllers as we can. Um, basically, all of um, the Linux supported controllers we're trying to support as good as we can. Um, there will be different forms of payment APIs coming up. Um, yeah, and there's a couple of corporations that are um, in progress right now. And what's probably the most important point here is that uh, Everest is a truly open project. So any, anyone is really welcome to join and have fun with us. Yeah, and I think that's the um, end to the formal part. So we can stop recording now. <laughs>